Hi, my name is Brad Neal, and let's talk about section 4.1 from the OpenStax book. Um, specifically, we're going to be talking about balancing chemical reactions, um, as well as then going over uh, total and net ionic equations. Um, so what you hopefully can see here are some questions that are pretty representative of the kinds of questions um, you might experience when it comes to balancing. So later on in this chapter, we're going to get into the different kinds of reactions that exist, etc. Right now, we're going to be focusing in on just balancing equations. And I'm fighting here trying to get my notepad going so that we can get started with this party. Okie doke. So um, let's get going. Couple, and so I thought what we could do here is work through some of these problems and then me just give you some commentary about um, these kinds of things in general so that one, you get the experience of seeing these problems worked out and then two, um, I can maybe add some context to the reading that you did. So here we go. Write and balance chemical equations for each of the chemical reactions. Be sure to include phases. So phases are going to be important, especially when it comes to the kinds of reactions that we're going to be doing. Um, your typical phases are going to be solid, liquid, gas, as well as aqueous. And aqueous is going to come from um, meaning that we've got something that is um, dissolved in solution. So the way we would write these is our solid, our uh, liquid, and our gas. Now, whenever we write these after a species uh, on our trends, we're going to put these in parentheses. Those are the world's worst parentheses. You get the idea, hopefully. Um, aqueous is going to get AQ. Okay. So let's go ahead and let's get the party started. First off, we have to know how to be able to write a chemical formula based off of the name of the species. We've got aqueous, tells us right there in the beginning of this one, it's aqueous copper 2 sulfate. So copper 2 sulfate, take a second, write out what the chemical formula is. Okay, so we've got copper 2 sulfate. That's going to be telling us that the sulfate uh, has that negative two charge, the copper has a plus two charge, boom, it's ready to go. It's aqueous, so that means we put the AQ there, uh, and is combined with solid aluminum. So now we have written out all of our reactants. Everything that we mix together for a reaction to occur is going to be one of our reactants. Um, so reactants. Reactants. Now we put our reaction arrow here to denote that a chemical change is going to take place. And specifically, or some kind of change is taking place. We could actually put this arrow here uh, in the case of if we were undergoing a phase change. So let's just say we had uh, ice turning into liquid water. We could put H2O parentheses solid and then arrow H2O parentheses liquid. So we have a change. Arrows mm -hmm. indicating change. Um, so it is forming aqueous aluminum sulfate. So aluminum sulfate, SO4, but based off our charges, you hopefully remember that that's going to be the formula for our aluminum sulfate here and our and oh, it said it's aqueous, so we need to put the AQ here, and we need to put the solid copper, so C-U-S. Okay, so um, this kind of reaction is fairly standard. Uh, what we have is a single displacement kind of reaction. Reaction types, again, we'll talk about those names later on. Um, the key things here to focus on are the reactants and everything over here is going to be a product. Product. Now we've got that whole thing of you can neither create nor destroy matter. Uh, that whole conservation of mass and um, conservation of matter thing. So what that's going to mean then is this, we have to have the same number of atoms of every single individual species on the left as we do on the right. 
So on the left of our balanced equation, the reactants and in the products. This is where we're gonna use numbers that go out in front of these chemical species. I'm just drawing these lines right here because that's where they're eventually gonna go. These numbers out in front are called our stoichiometric coefficients. So stoichiometric coefficients. And you know probably how to spell that better than I do. Coefficients, there we go, we got there. All right, the stoichiometric coefficients are what we are going to use for balancing. Importantly, the stoichiometric coefficient applies to every single atom that's in your compound. Um, and we'll walk through an example here. The way that I like to explain this to people is um, basically do a chemical dosey do -si -do. Um, that works really well with the double displacement kind of reaction. Hopefully you'll see what I'm talking about here. You know, like those stereotypical hoedowns or dance hall, whatever kinds of things, especially with country music, like the olden country music. Um, you would have partners and then uh, somebody would be able to cut in and start dancing with that other person's partner. And you could continuously have this kind of uh, do -si do happening. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Here we have a situation where the copper um, is on the reactant side with our sulfate. On our product side, it is by itself. It is in just its atomic form. So it, the copper sulfate, is the partner that's getting changed out by the aluminum from our reactant side. That's what I'm talking about when I'm saying we're changing our partners. So this one's fairly straightforward. We just need to count up and see how much we've got of everything on the left and how much we have of everything on the right. Um, so let's get started. Here on the left, the right now, we've got this uh, one copper and we have one sulfate. I don't like to, unless I have to, write it down all the elements on a polyatomic ion individually. The reason that you would want to write out all the atoms in a polyatomic ion individually is in the case of a combustion reaction. Um, and then they're not really polyatomics per se. Oxygen gets a little weird. There's some examples of that in your homework that will help you. And the reading also goes over examples with combustion reactions. They're like the odd ducks, if you will, of this kind of thing in terms of balancing. They require just a little bit more foresight. But at the end of the day, the number of atoms on the left of any species have to equal the number of atoms on the right of any species. So if we look right now, we've got one copper on the left, and that is because we have this implied one right here. We have one copper on the right because we have this implied one over here. And so that means that our copper is balanced, at least right now. That balancing may change based off of more information that we get. So for example, now if we look at our sulfate, in our reactant side, we have one single sulfate next to the copper. But on our product side over here, we don't have one sulfate, we have three, as denoted by that subscript right here. There's three sulfates. So we need three sulfates on our reactant side. Now, you might think that you could put a three outside here, but if you do that, you're going to change the chemical formula of copper sulfate because you can't change the chemical formula of copper sulfate, at least not legally. Um, putting a three right where we did is wrong, so we need to get rid of that three. What we can do, though, is put a three out in the front as our stoichiometric coefficient. The three is going to then say we have three sulfates, but it's also going to say we have three copper as well. So, and I'm just gonna get rid of those real quick just so that we can see the other question. That three applies to every single ion, every single atom within a chemical formula. So now we have three coppers on our reactant side. We need to go back and to our product side, and we need to put a three there in front of our copper. So now we have three coppers in our reactants and three coppers on our products. 
time to do aluminum. So aluminum on our reactant side, we have one. Aluminum on our product side, we have two, as denoted by the subscript, part of the chemical formula. So that means then we need to have two aluminum on our reactant side. So our stoichiometric coefficient here is going to be two. Okay, we balanced every single atom. Let's go back and let's check every single atom though, uh, or every single ion, and let's make sure that it's right. Because sometimes when we do these, you change one thing and it causes a ripple effect on out. Um, so it's good to check. So we've got three copper reactants. We've got three copper products. We've got three sulfates on the reactants. We've got three sulfates on the products. We've got two aluminum, two aluminum. Boom, we have balanced the chemical equation for this reaction and we wrote out the phases based on what the problem told us. Okay, now let's go ahead and let's make this a little bit more fun though, shall we? And by making it a little bit more fun, what we wanna do is our total, um, let's write this in a different color. We wanna write out our total ionic equation and we wanna write out our net ionic equation. Okay, so to do this, the easiest thing to start with is our total ionic equation. We want to have a balanced chemical equation to start with. So what everything we just did is gonna be very helpful for this total ionic equation. Total ionic equation basically tells us anything that is in the aqueous phase, like we've got right here in this uh, copper sulfate and in the uh, aluminum sulfate, anything that is aqueous, we, when we write out the totally ionic equation, will not have these species forming a compound because by saying aqueous, we're really designating that they're soluble. They disassociate when in water. The copper and the sulfate kind of get their, go their own little ways and water molecules surround them and keep them solvated. So as such, when we write the total ionic equation, we're going to say that we've got copper, and specifically it was in a two plus charge, being aqueous. Because that's really what's happening in the solution. We have co copper ions floating around kind of by themselves. Now specifically though, the balanced equation told us that we had three copper sulfates. So we don't wanna forget that part down here when we're writing out our total ionic equation. We wanna put the three out in front of the copper ions. So now plus, because we're done with the copper, three sulfates because the balanced equation said it was three copper sulfates. So we do this and we put the aqueous there. The aqueous now is indicating that this is dissolved. It's fantastic. Plus our two aluminums and the aluminums are here in the solid phase. We're gonna go ahead and continue on writing out our products. It was aluminum, but we had two of them a part of the chemical formula. So each aluminum had a three plus ion. The aluminum sulfate is soluble. It disassociates, so it has aluminum ions and sulfate ions floating around separately of one another. So we don't have a single aluminum ion on our product side. We have two of them. So we need to put a two out in front of the aluminum written out there. Plus, oh, not plus, we need to put our phase. So that's aqueous. And I'm starting to block the thing here a little bit. So we're gonna scroll up just a smidge. So we put our aqueous there. We had three sulfates as part of that aluminum sulfate. So three SO4, two minus aqueous. And we have three copper and solid. That should all be on one line, but I ran out of space. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the total ionic equation. We've written out every single species that can be dissolved, and we know it's, dis we know it's soluble if it says it's aqueous. If it says it's solid, we can't dissolve it. It doesn't disassociate. If it's a gas, it doesn't dissolve. Well, it might dissolve, but it doesn't disassociate. So, we would not have a species in a gas disassociated in a total ionic equation. We would have something like we have written out here. 
you know, if I can find the, there we go. If I can find the uh, cursor, it's time to do the net ionic equation. So that net ionic equation now is basically going to be the exact same thing as the total ionic equation, but we want to do a little bit of work ahead of time and we want to identify anything that looks exactly the same on both the reactant and product side of our reaction. And what we see here is we've got three sulfates in the aqueous form as both reactants and products. These things are not doing anything. They're just, they're basically acting as counter ions to make sure that our species is electrically neutral. They're not involved in the reaction in any strong, meaningful way. The species that are involved in the reaction are going to be the copper and the aluminum because they are changing phases, right? We're going from aqueous copper to solid copper. We're going from solid aluminum to aqueous aluminum. Those are undergoing some kind of change, some kind of process, um, whereas the sulfate looks the exact same on both the left and the right. Because they look the same on the left and the right, we're going to call it a spectator ion. Spectator ion. Fantastic. Spectator ions are not written as part of your net ionic equation. So our net ionic equation here then will include everything that is not a spectator. So it's gonna be three Cu2 plus aqueous, put an A there in front of that Q, aqueous plus our two aluminum solid, going to form two aluminum ions, aqueous, and three copper solid. Sulfate's there. It's totally there in the reaction still. It's just not doing anything. And we know it's not doing anything because it exists the exact same on both the left and the right. So this is the net ionic equation. Net ionic equation. So that's the three kinds of reactions you've got. You've got your just regular old balance equation, which is what you're going to use a lot of the time. Your total ionic equation, which realistically we just use until we get really good at writing out just the net ionic equation. And then the net ionic equation, which is the one that um, we often think about as chemists. We may not write it out. We often write it out. We often don't write it out, but this is the one that indicates what species in a reaction are actually undergoing some kind of change. Okay, so let's see here if I could bring up those questions again. Yep, we can. Let's work out the next one. All right, ammonium gas reacts with oxygen gas to produce nitrogen gas and gaseous water. Wow, a lot of gas. So, hey, this problem is nice. It gave you what ammonia is. Ammonia, NH3, it says it's a gas, reacts with oxygen gas. Now, since it's saying oxygen gas, what this is really trying to tell you is molecular oxygen. Remember the diatomic stuff that we've talked about in discussion sections? So oxygen gas to produce nitrogen gas, another one of our diatomics, and gaseous water. And we're going to do H-O-H. -H. Um, there's not a great reason why I write out H-O-H -H for this problem. It doesn't really matter. When we do acid-base uh, kinds of problems later on in the semester, writing out water like that's a little helpful, and I'll explain it why I do that then. But for right now, we really can just do the exact same principles as balancing the previous question. We can say... Do we have the same number of atoms of a given species on the left? Do we have the same number on the right? If not, how do we balance it? So here we go. Let's start with our ammonia and specifically the nitrogen. On our reactants, we have how many? Yep, we have one. On our products, we have two. So we need to put a two as our stoichiometric coefficient in front of our ammonia. Remember that two now is going for the nitrogen and going for this hydrogen right here. So while we're here, why don't we go ahead and balance out the hydrogen? So we have a total now of six hydrogen, two from the stoichiometric coefficient, three that the ammonia as a molecule has, 
for a total of six. Six hydrogens on the reactants. We go over here to the products and we have two. So if we put a three, let's get that back to a color scheme that we've been normally using, three in front of the uh, water. Now we have three here and three here based off of that exact same nomenclature stuff that we, or I'm sorry, the same kind of mechanisms that we've been using. Cool. So now our hydrogen is balanced. Last thing we got to figure out here is our oxygen. So for our oxygen, we have two on our reactant side and we have three on our product side. Okay. This is where things get a little bit different depending on which instructor you've had you, or have. There's two ways that you can do this. One, the first, and this is the way that I normally do it. I don't like having any kind of fractional number as part of my stoichiometric coefficients. Right now, there's not a good way of balancing two oxygens on the reactants and three on the product side. What I can do on my reactant side is I could multiply by three halves. So if I multiply by three halves, the O2 here on the reactant side, well, the three halves multiplied by two gives me a total of three, right? Just doing a little bit of fraction math. So now I've got three oxygens on the reactant side and I've got three oxygens on the product side. Some instructors, some textbooks are totally comfortable with you doing this. And if you wanna do it, cool. Most of the time what you're gonna see me do though is multiply the entire everything that's in the equation by two so that I get the lowest whole number stoichiometric coefficient that I possibly can. So if I'm going to then get the lowest whole number stoichiometric that I possibly can, I'm gonna to have to multiply every coefficient in every chemical formula by two. By doing that, then I get four NH3 still in the gas phase and I now get, multiplying by two, three oxygens in the gas phase going to form, and multiplying by two still, two nitrogens in the gas phase, and I get six waters in the gas phase. I can go back and I can count up every single one of my atoms involved in this chemical reaction here, and it's going to balance. That's the cool thing about the balancing stuff is if you do it right, even if you multiply by a coefficient uh, or multiply by all of your coefficients by some number and you do it consistently, everything will still balance. Strictly speaking, you want to have the lowest whole number ratio possible using your lowest common denominator for all species in your balancing. In this case, this is the lowest whole number. But like I said, sometimes you're going to see that three halves, especially in front of an oxygen, because oxygen's just a little bit wonky and multiplying by three halves doesn't really hurt anything because diatomic oxygen is realistically getting split anyways um, as part of this process. So it's no big deal. You could also do the three halves in front of nitrogen. You just don't typically see it in front of nitrogen like you do oxygen. Oxygen's kind of that special case. And this is kind of along the lines of what I was talking about with respect to combustion reactions. So if you have something that's got carbon, hydrogens, and oxygens uh, in it, this three halves kind of thing takes place. So now if we were gonna write out our total and our net ionic equations for here, well, congratulations, we actually pretty much already have. We don't have anything that's gonna disassociate. Everything's already in the gas form. Uh, we don't have any ionic species really to speak of. Um, so they're not gonna have an ionic form for us to write out. So these are kind of de facto our total and our net ionic equations already uh, written out for us. So that's kind of nice. All right, let's do this last example. All right. And here we go. Uh, aqueous solution of lead nitrate. Okay, so it's aqueous, and that is not the right pen for this thing. I tell you what, Bauer wrote all over with a marker. That would have really been a bummer. 
Okay, so we got lead two nitrate. Again, you gotta know what your chemical formula is. So it's lead two. Um, nitrate is a single negatively charged species. So it means I'm gonna have to have two and that's gonna be aqueous because that's what the problem tells me. And sodium, sodium phosphate, so Na3PO4, and it is saying it is, doesn't tell us, oh, aqueous solutions, duh. So it's plural, so they're both going to be, the problem is telling us that they're both aqueous here. Uh, they are mixed, okay, so they're mixed, thus the plus, and it results in a precipitation of solid lead sulfate, PB, or lead, I'm sorry, lead phosphate, uh, P, uh, that's not pretty, but it gets the job done. Now, solid, okay? Another way that you could write out the solid instead of putting the S, uh, sometimes people will put the downward arrow like that, and that is meaning that this is a solid and it's falling out of solution. Uh, organic chemists sometimes call this crashing out of solution because, um, you know, it sounds like it's a little bit more fun if you're saying it's crashing out. Um, and I wrote these things so big that I've got to write down my other product down below. Wouldn't normally do that, but I, like I said, and then it's going to be sodium nitrate. Uh, and it's saying it's aqueous, so AQ. Cool. So let's do the balancing now. All right. This is definitively uh, a chemical hoedown. And so follow along with what I'm going to do here, um, and it should make life a little easier. So first things first, I suggest kind of putting a line between all of your anions and your cations. And that's like the world's worst, whatever. And then this right here. So these red lines here are supposed to separate the anions versus the cations. The reason for this is we can balance just one side of each compound at a time in the fashion like so. Uh, let's pick a different color. How about this nice magenta? That looks good. Oh, pink. I'm sorry. Pink. Ready? Here we go. We have one lead. It's one because there's the one on, that's implied by the lead here on our reactant side. So we've got the one right there. So we have one lead there. On our product side, we're going to have three leads. So our reactant sides need th three leads. Now, instead of trying to balance the nitrate, stick with the lead phosphate that was on the product side. So stick with the lead phosphate. How many phosphates do you have? Two, okay? So then go to your reactant side and balance just the phosphate. How many phosphates do you have on your reactant side? One. So we're gonna need a two out in front of that phos sodium phosphate on the reactant side. Now the phosphates are balanced. Okay, stick with the sodium phosphate. How many sodiums do you have total? Well, you've got the two as your stoichiometric coefficient. You have the three sodiums within each sodium phosphate for a total of six sodiums. So you have six on your reactant side. How many sodiums do you have on the product side? Well, right now you only have the one. So we need a six out in front of that to balance the sodiums. Stay with the sodium nitrate. How many nitrates do you have on the product side? Well, we just put that six out in front of it. So we have six nitrates on the products. How many nitrates do we have on the reactant side? Well, we have three as the stoichiometric coefficient that we wrote out here a while ago. And we had the two as the subscript for the nitrate. So the nitrate has a total of six. So we have six nitrates. So nitrates are balanced. Okay, go and see Stick with the lead nitrate that's now in your reactants. Well, hey, we're back at lead. Isn't lead the thing that we started with to begin with? It is. So this method is start with one thing, balance it on both sides, and then whichever side that you just came to, balance that cation or anions, complementary ion, and you go back and forth, almost like this ping pong game, balancing your ions back and forth, back and forth, in this kind of way. So as a kind of fast version here, um, one of the things I always suggest people do is you double check your work. So let's do that. We have three LEDs on our reactant side um, and we have three LEDs 
on our product side. Stick with it. Product side, that is. We have two phosphates on our product side. We have two, from the stoichiometric coefficient, two phosphates on our reactant side. So the phosphates are happy. You'll hear me say a lot because they're balanced. Stick with it. We have two, we have not two sodiums, we have six sodiums here on our reactant side. So we go over to our product side and we have six sodiums. Sodium's happy. Stick with the sodium nitrate. How many nitrates do you have? Six, based on the coefficient in front of the nitrate. And so, boom, you've got six nitrates. Go over to your reactant side, you have six nitrates. We've gone through everything twice now. None of our numbers have changed. They shouldn't have, sometimes they will. Remember that unintended ripple effect thing that I was talking about? Sometimes, especially uh, for problems like combustion reactions, you're gonna see if you try to do that bouncing back and forth thing, um, your species might change on you a little bit. That's why I always suggest going through it twice. Because if you go through it and you're like, oh, it doesn't make sense the second time, and then you go through it the third time, and you're like, it still doesn't make sense, that's a really good indication that you actually have one of your chemical formulas written incorrectly. So to recap here, you have no chance of doing one of these balancing problems unless you've got the ability to go from naming to chemical formulas, which is why I beg, borrow, and pleaded with you to get good at the chemical formulas. Um, because they are just so pivotally important for the rest of the semester. So if you have questions about that, please let me know so we can continue to practice those kinds of things. Um, so name, like you got to turn a name into a formula. Then from your formula, a proper formula, then you're going to do this whole kind of going back and forth from products to reactants, making sure that you have all the right number of spe atoms involved in each species or ion involved in each species. Then for your total ionic equation, you're going to separate any species that are soluble um, and you're going to know if it's soluble or not because it's going to have the aqueous behind it. So any time you've got the aqueous, it's the world's worst highlighter color there, the aqueous, um, anytime you've got that, you're going to know that you should be writing out these species involved in these compounds as their separate ions for your total ionic equation. And then for your net ionic equation, you're gonna to try to identify all the spectator ions and you're not going to write them out as part of that net ionic equation. So my challenge for you is to take the uh, thing that we've got just up here, this lead uh, nitrate and sodium phosphate equation, and you try to write out the total and net ionic equations for yourself. And then ask me questions based on that uh, and your attempts at trying this. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is the essence of balancing chemical reactions. It just requires a lot of practice. Um, you'll start to get into a rhythm of these kinds of things. Um, that it's going to not necessarily be super quick at the beginning, but it just, like I said, it just takes practice, practice, practice. And if you run out of practice problems in the homework, Make sure you hit up the exercises that are in your book. If you run out of exercises that are in your book, contact me and I got practice problems for days that I can give you. Um, and I'd be happy to work through any of these that you would want um, whenever you would like. Well, as long as it fits on our schedules. You know how that goes. So at this point in time, we are done with this video. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions or any kind of feedback regarding this. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks. I can find the stop button because, you know, stop recording.